All right, all right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Brittany Morrison and I am one of the youth reps from the Black Youth Collaborative. So the Black Youth Collaborative is a collective of 20 Black students and Black and allied organizations across the greater Toronto area that are working together to strengthen the education system when it comes to Black students experiencing racism and discrimination. Again, we're so excited that you're here with us today. Before we go over the agenda, Jada will read the Land and African Contribution Acknowledgement. Hi, hi, my name is Jada and I'm also a part of the Black Youth Collaborative and I'll be reading the land acknowledgement. This land is the territory of, of the Hirwendat and Petin First Nations, the Seneca and the most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the dish with one spoon, one plum belt covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. We recognize the enduring presence of the indigenous people on this land. Additionally, in accordance with the international decade of people of African descent and the years beyond, we recognize the historical contributions and revolutionary acts of stolen Africans on stolen indigenous land. These ancestors that have departed this world, leaving a legacy of hope and resilience due to the horrific historical impacts of colonization, we acknowledge how discrimination and racism is endured by its descendants and embedded in systems to that's still present today. On this day and every day, we acknowledge the ongoing global contributions of Africans and specifically Black Canadians to Canadian society. Wonderful, thank you so much for that powerful um, acknowledgement, Jada. Um, hi everyone, my name is Alana Lowe and I'm a equity advisor and I'm also a community worker. Um, I'm here today very feeling very honored to be able to work in collaboration with different organizations, um, to work in collaboration with them to make resources, and to work in collaboration with them to create this change of theory report. Um, so just so in case, because I was telling folks earlier that you know my technical stuff is here and there, um, you can download the, sli the slides and follow along with us by going to stolenfromafrica.org. And also there's the report is there. Um, there's a ton of resources that are there. And we're also gonna be going through all of that stuff as we go through this session. So just wanted to say thank you again for joining us today to, for taking the time. And uh, we look forward to all the information that we'll be presenting to you. Thank you again for joining us today. We have um, been working together for two years. Um, collectively for two years um, before and during this pandemic. And as Black students, families, and organizations, we think that it's really important that this work isn't just published and put on a shelf or lost on, an, on, a, web, on a web page. Um, we really want to use this opportunity, um, use this as an opportunity to showcase and highlight some of the strategies that we've been working on and to share some of the resources that we've created. Shem will share what we have planned for you today. Hello, y'all. My name is Shem. Um, I'm also a rep of the Black Collaborative, Black Youth Collaborative. I'm currently a student at Trent University. I'm enrolled in the um, International Development African Studies Program. I'll be going over what the agenda calls for today. So on the agenda, we have the theory of change, which will take about 10 minutes. And then we have community voices. And then resources for parents, educators, and youth workers. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A and a two minute closing. Thanks, Shem. As Brittany mentioned before, we've been meeting in person and online for almost two years to create a, theory, a change of theory report to explore systems, responses to anti-Black racism in the education system and how to make the education, how to make education more inclusive for Black students. Before I was even born, there were reports, and we know there were continued to be reports long after. It's our hope that this report goes beyond most typical reports. We aim to provide useful resources and collective knowledge that present more information about solutions and not just the problems. On the website, you can find the full report. If you're limited on time, there's also a one pager. Also on our website, you'll find some cool and necessary resources. They include an educator slash youth worker checklist 
for creative, positive, affirming spaces for Black students. You can also share this with staff at your school or community group. There's also a timeline of anti-Black racism in Ontario, an outline of systems, roles, and, com and the complaint processes, and a journey map of Black students' experiences. Thanks, Jada. Thanks, Jada, for sharing the tools and resources. So I want to remind you guys that you guys can go download those resources for free, as you guys it's also included in the report. Now we'll be, we will be quickly talking about theory of change. So after a series of brainstorming, we imagined this vision, a vision where we had to think to ourselves, what would make a perfect school? And what would that look like for Black students? And not only Black students, but all students from, from different walks of life. So, um, we wanted to. We wanted an education. Basically, that brought us to what we um, an idea of what we wanted. We wanted an education system that was free of anti-black racism, and one that included our experiences and knowledge. From there, we worked backwards and thought, how do we get there? So we came up with three strategies. Strategy one: increase the capacity of black students, families, and community leaders through collaboration. Strategy two, design resources for Black students, families, educators, and community leaders to better understand and navigate the educational system. And lastly, strategy number three, create black, a Black-led, Black-centered um, community coalition that is um, that um, in order to advocate and inform effective systems change strategies. For strategy one, we participated in various activities to see how best to execute the strategy. We created a Black student and Black organization-led collaborative of 20 Black students and four organizations across Toronto. We created a self-determined government st a governance structure. We participated in weekly peer-led Black affirming workshops and trainings. And we also participated in a social justice research inqu inquiry. Details about all these activities can be found in the report appendices. So for strategy two, we created a system mapping of all key roles and governance structures within the education system. We also did a journey mapping of how the system in this current state is, uh, is experienced by Black students and families. We also created a timeline of, time of anti-Black racism in, in education in Ontario, a resource that can be used by educators and youth workers to help people better understand the historical impacts and then not last but not least, we created a student the guide to navigate COVID-19 to address anti-Black racism and systemic barriers in virtual education. All these resources can be found in the uh, report's appendix. And for strategy three, we identified Black community organizations across Toronto to identify organizations and services provided citywide and to identify critical gaps in support. We did an ongoing needs assessment to identify strengths and gaps in resources and information among collaborative members. And we, pro we uh, provided workshops and trainings for parents and community members to build advocacy and systematic navigation skills. A list of trainings and details can be, um, a list of trainings and details can be found in the resources appendix. So what do we hope uh, the long-term result will be? In the long-term, we envision a world where Black students and Black youth-led groups and community organizations pool resources and energy to work in a, in a coordinated collaborative effort to advocate and inform effective and sustainable systems change. In the short term and long term, we hope to have several scalable frameworks for schools and organizations to create safe educational spaces that affirm, culturally engage, heal, and advocate for, for growth and the skills to support Black students, families, and to be self-determined in their academic and professional lives. And ultimately, we know we know this will it, we will see an increase in capacity, tools and resources for Black youth and families to advocate for themselves and their rights in the education in 
to their education and the educational spaces that are safe, anti-racist, positive, and trauma-free. Okay, well, thank you all so much for front-loading that report. And I, I appreciate for folks um, with your patience on with us, because we typically like to do things really interactive. And I guess, you know, with this online climate, it's, it's very difficult to engage or even feel safe. Like I was, even as we were doing outreach for this, I was afraid to put the, the, the information out there because, you know, of the bombings and the, uh, the, the, the Zoom bombings and stuff like that. So our hope is that once we are able to meet in person, we can collaborate with um, schools that I currently work with and community groups to have, you know, break bread, have some food and to do some more. But anyways, um, Brittany, Shem, Jada, thank you so much for um, breaking down um, all the hard work that you and the other community groups put into coming up with these strategies and participating in all those activities. So now we're gonna go to the community voices piece and we're gonna hear specific case studies um, from the four community organizations that were a part of this um, collaborative. So they're gonna pretty much talk about what specifically they do as community groups to create affirming programming um, for black youth in schools. And after that, we'll have a QA. and a and there's also like a checklist for educators and youth workers. And we're gonna also give people specific stuff on that. But I thought it would be a really good chance to hear explicitly how community programs that are actually housed within schools, how they're doing some of um, that work already. So our first group is um, Success Beyond Limits. We're gonna hear from Mo. Hey, what's up everyone? Um, I hope you are doing well. Uh, definitely shout out to the young people for, for um, breaking that down for us and, and also sharing some of that information. So um, I'm Mo, uh, Mohammed Ahmed, Mo, whichever. Uh, and, and I'm also with an organization called Success Beyond Limits. And we are a community-based organization focused on educational attainment. So we work with young people in the Jane Finch area. Um, we do this through year-round programming, reducing the barriers young people face. And this includes a summer transition program, providing youth in grade eight with their first high school credit and preparing them for a successful transition into high school. This also includes operating a unique youth space within a local high school dedicated to supporting and advocating for youth. Um, our work is what we call hyper-local with a system focus. So what that means is we meet the needs of our young people by supporting them academically and socially along their educational journey through various programs while advocating for them within systems of power. Some of those systems include education, the criminal justice system, or even housing. And what we're doing year round as well too, and also with, with, with collaboratives and groups like this is that you know, we push for conversations that show a need for targeted supports um, provided to our youth through programs and policies within each system. For us, education and community is fundamentally going to be the driving force for all of this. Um, uh, which is why it's definitely an area for us to focus on. Can we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, next slide. So some of the key strategies that we have used throughout the years is one, youth-led, right? Um, youth are involved in every step, governance, planning, evaluation, and program delivery. What that looks like is thinking about the graduation model that we have. So many of our program participants grow to become what we call mentors who are uh, uh, peer senior leaders in high school uh, uh, and giving back to the young people that they used to be in that position, for example. Some of our young people have uh, gone into governance and being part of our board of directors. They plan and evaluate um, and support the program delivery. Collaboration, um, success is dependent on collaboration between individuals, organizations, uh, agencies, institutions, and movements. So for us to be a part of conversations in circles like this um, is really important. So community-based, our focus, mandate, and staffing are community-based, community-focused, and community-empowered. So what that means is right now, everyone, all our staff members are from the same community that we serve, right? What we do is we bring in the, the experiences, the expertise and the knowledge that we have into the programming, into the work that we do and how we support young people in various spaces. Um, our work is community focused and community voice. So um, we, we, we cater to the needs of the young people uh, and, and their families. 
Flexibility is huge for us. Um, so all of our programming stays flexible in order to respond to, to, to the voice of youth and their changing needs, especially during the pandemic when we had to pivot to online programming. We had to really um, think about how we're gonna do that work. And because we were able to, I think, create an, you know, a, a type of space that we can be flexible. When the pandemic um, uh, first hit back in March of 2020, we were able to quickly uh, pivot to supporting our young people within a month or two um, uh, online, uh, on the ground where we can, um, and in areas that we haven't explored before as well too. So flexibility is, is huge, and, and and it has a you know it has brought a lot more insight, uh, given what's been happening during the pandemic. Thank you so much, though. Thank you, Mo. Um, we're going to hear next from Tina at um, Each One Teach One, which is also at Central Tech. Hi, everyone. All right, so as Lena mentioned, um, Each One Teach One is a program that was created by uh, teachers and, uh, at Central Tech and is run at Central Tech. And we started this 10 years ago. And what we did was we began by running weekly workshops for our Black students. And we invited Black artists, Black activists, Black mentors, Black community leaders to come and speak to our students about issues that impacted them and impacted their engagement in school. And we held these workshops during the instructional day. So that means we held them between 8.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. because we wanted our Black students to know that these issues were equally as of, 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 of importance as the curriculum that they were learning in their classes. And over time, our students uh, asked for uh, more information about these topics. They wanted more detail, they wanted more knowledge. So we created the Each One Teach One course, which allowed students to earn a credit and also interrogate these issues in more depth. And um, through this course, it's essentially the HIF 201 course, which is called the Individual and the Family, but we flipped it to become the Black Individual and the Black Family. And students will, um, do a research project and they also learn how to become agents of change so that they can advocate for themselves and for their community. Uh, because the Each One Teach One program teaches through a hip hop lens, uh, we also offer an after school or a lunchtime arts component, uh, depending on the interest of our students of any particular year. So over the past 10 years, we run a full gamut of having had a graffiti art program, we've had a beat making program, spoken word program, and a hip hop dance or a b-boy b-girl program. And um, that basically is, an, in a nutshell, how we have created an affirming space for Black youth um, in a system that's not necessarily designed to support Black youth. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Tina. Um, I just remember like when I first, I must have met you when I was like 18, 19, when I was like just starting out volunteering um, and I just really appreciate that you've seen me grow and I've had the opportunity to see you grow as an educator and also to watch your programming grow, to be accredited course, um, and to just be, you know, the science genius, all the just amazing initiatives that you provide locally and across the system. Just really appreciate you for everything that you do and the, the work that you're doing. I always look to you to see um, what's being done. Also to you too, Mo, like, you know what I mean? I, I didn't forget to big you up. I'm just trying to manage a few things at once. But yeah, also to SVL too, like the energy and the vibe of, of the kids in Fitch is next level. And to see young people um, being engaged to that level and to feel motivated and, and, and to um, create that access is next level too. So anyways, thank you so much. So we're going to talk really quickly about Freedom School. So unfortunately, um, Freedom School couldn't be with us today. Um, a young person, um, Jacob, um, from there, that, that's a community leader within their programming and is a community leader that's connected to programs across Toronto. Um, unfortunately, he, was, um, he passed, he was struck um, while riding his bike by a drunk driver. So um, the staff there are supporting him and the family. They've got a GoFundMe page. Um, so if you um, are able to um, support that fund um, and really just support Freedom School and all the organizations here doing um, this work. Cause I think that, you know, a lot of times when it comes to wanting to do this work I think there's a lot of really powerful strategies and solutions 
But a lot of times as a community, because we're under-resourced and because we're, we're dealing with such complex issues, it's very difficult to, to move this work and then also have to deal with tragedies. And, and these tragedies are often, um, and they're, they're often a result um, sometimes of, of the education system and youth not being in school and in the streets. So I think that, um, I know that this particular case isn't like that, but I'm just wanting to use this as, as an opportunity to kind of show you all the different things that community organizations often have to balance while trying to solve systemic racism. But also I know there's a lot of educators on the call that are doing the same and are in a very similar situation and having to be an educator in social work. So again, I just really appreciate everyone coming together to support um, this process. Um, so just really quickly to talk about Freedom School. Um, Freedom School is a youth and parent driven initiative that fights against anti-Black racism in the school system and to create educational alternatives for Black children. So they run a really interesting um, summer camp for school-age children. So they work with younger youth um, from age four to 12, and they talk about um, a whole host of issues. What I really like about their programming is that it's also a really supportive space for um, students that are like non-gender conforming, non-binary, that are a part of the LGBT community. I think that we, we definitely need a lot more programs and more spaces that are able to talk about black identity, but to also include and to be a safer space for students um, and, and for youth that are, are, are queer, that are um, just exploring themselves and their identities and being able to connect with other people and to have representation. So um, I'll, yeah, I just wanted to say that. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go back to the presentation slides and just talk about some of the key strategies that Freedom School uses when it comes to creating positive and affirming spaces for Black students. I like to, I think that like Freedom School is like a 2.0 when it comes to um, culturally responsive pedagogy. Like that's like a very, a term that's used a lot within um, school spaces. And I think that it's, yes, it's important to bring cultures into the school, but I think that, you know, Freedom School talks about being self-determined and, you know, Black liberation and bringing parents into that process. And I think that it's really good to include cultures and to have representation and to do a lot of the things that we put on our checklist. But I think it's really important that we're able to provide um, programming that is self-determined, that allows Black students to have choice and to lead those spaces that, you know, pro to provide programming that makes people, Black people feel free. And that's something that Freedom School really focuses on. They have a lot of really good um, uh, resources um, on their website and they have like YouTube videos that um, really showcase some of that stuff. So I like also that they take a system-wide um, approach to change. So they were very active, I believe, on the police-free schools, the SRO process of the school, like getting the officers out of the school. I, I know that there's definitely different um, opinions on that. But I know that specifically for Freedom School, you know, it was about finding ways to make school safer. And for a lot of students, they didn't feel that the police were safe um, present. They weren't a safe presence in their school. And, and young people were catching charges for things that they probably shouldn't have, that they shouldn't have caught charges for. So I know um, Freedom School is also very active um, in the streets in terms of um, like, you know, political um, community mobilizing and um, being on the ground with some of these issues as well. Okay, so we'll leave it at that and we're going to go on to Stolen from Africa, another family person that I've known for a long time. <laughs> Neil, yes, logic. Definitely, yes. Definitely a, a, a family affair here, man. Big up to everyone who's been like supporting all of the youth that have been taking the initiative. Um, it, it's just been like a, an incredible journey and extremely motivational. Um, yeah, so Stolen from Africa, like we started back out in uh, 2004, and it uh, began a, as a t-shirt movement to like elevate consciousness. Um, we were really interested about finding ways to like empower ourselves, build up like self-esteem. And this was all really done through hip hop. I just love how hip hop is just like this foundational um, tool to bring awareness. And it was through um, the beginning phases of using like arts and, um, and education um, to bring about this, this awareness. So um, us getting into schools began as just um, doing Black History Month presentations. And um, we would bring, you know, knowledge of what we call like, you know, like hidden Black Canadian history to, um, to, to, to the um, students. 
And we would talk about things like, you know, like Africaville or, or like Owen Sound and like, you know, Emancipation Day Festival. And, you know, that would just kind of generate interest for, for these young people to want to learn more about their culture, their history, and then to be more, um, I guess, like an intrigued and engaged way with education, realizing that like how schooling has been presented to them, that there's, you know, some missing elements, you know, oftentimes, like, as we know, the curriculum doesn't really reflect um, the multiculturalism of, of our communities. And so us bringing this, this um, type of knowledge, you know, um, gained interest. And then from there, uh, we just started doing um, workshops and just building and um, expanding um, to the point where we have now a partnership with uh, with both school boards, the Toronto District School Board, as well as the Catholic Board. And um, we're supporting students through um, culturally relevant programming during school hours, as well as um, outside of school hours. And um, it's been a, a really, um, you know, just inspiring moment or, or um, way of just seeing how things have been evolving over time. And um, we're just really happy to create these spaces. So I guess um, if you can move forward to the next slide, um, some of our key strategies as mentioning, um, engaging and creating relevant programming. So we have um, several programs, the responsibility program, which really focuses on like, you know, emotional intelligence, um, personal developments and other skill developments. Um, we also been focusing on, you know, creating accessibility, as we know, on creating um, educational resources and strengthening partnerships. So this is working in collaboration with, uh, with teachers, uh, principals, guidance counselors, youth workers. Um, we've been privileged to um, create spaces for mediation and advocate on behalf of um, students as well as parents and um, to offer um, just different ways of, of approaching and dealing with students. And that leads into like training and resources. So creating um, trainings for, for, st for staff to um, be a little more culturally um, responsive and you know, create spaces for empathy and just understanding and uh, just creating an overall uh, holistic supportive environment. Okay, lovely. I just want to make sure that you're done before I just jump on. All right, amazing logic. Thank you so much. Um, I met you similar around the time when I met Tina. And I feel like, you know, I was in my early 20s. Um, I was like just learning about my history. And I remember seeing Stolen from Africa. And then I thought to myself, like, what is like, what is it about? I realized, yeah, yeah stolen from Africa, stolen from the Americas. Do you know what I mean? I didn't even know that slavery happened in Canada. I didn't know, um, you know, so much of the, the Black Canadian history that existed. And when I met you, it was like I found a piece of myself because I finally was able to connect myself to a place that I was born, to a place that my grandmothers came to, to the place where my parents met and had me. And I felt, because I felt so displaced throughout my entire life. And I feel like, you know, Stolen from Africa really gave me a purpose. It gave me a sense of like something to be proud of, you know, Stolen from Africa, like able to wear that as a badge, like my ancestors survived that. And I really do appreciate, you know, the way that you bring that vibe into the classroom, because I, I really do think that, you know, when it comes to building, affirming inclusive spaces, it's how do we really make young people feel connected, you know, and in a meaningful way. And I've seen you do that over and over again. So Absolutely. I appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate you making the way, man. Let me take Good. up space, you know, big up myself, big up yourself logic. Okay, okay, let's go on. We're actually making really good time. So um, I'm really excited about that. So um, the other um, really good part with um, this report are the resources that come along with the report. The resources, the, the pages of the resources are actually longer than the report itself. So I just wanted to say to you all, please go to the website and um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll repost the information in the chat, but please go to the website and check out some of these resources because um, even if you as an educator or parent or um, a youth worker, you might be very well versed in some of this stuff, but I really do think that this can be stuff that you can share with your coworkers um, or you know, at your, at your, in your school community um, to really um, support our efforts in making schools safer places for, for Black students and families. So I'm actually gonna have Chelsea come on. Chelsea is a student equity program advisor with the Toronto District School Board. She's gonna be kind of co-presenting some of these resources with me because she really supported us in um, creating some of this stuff. 
She's been with the school board for a really long time. She's been supporting a lot of the young people that I've been working with, especially as a youth worker, in navigating through it. So, you know, a student is suspended and they come to me and they tell me that, you know, it was unfair and they're, they're, they, they might get kicked out of school. Chelsea's the person that I call. A young person um, is assaulted by her boyfriend and the situation isn't taken seriously because she's black and her boyfriend's white. I call Chelsea and say, listen, they're, they're trying to kick, they're trying to move this, the student out of the, the school when really they should be moving the person that perpetuated the violence again, against her. I call Chelsea, Chelsea helps me kind of navigate through some of that stuff. So we'll be hearing from her shortly. So I'll go through the first resource um, that was created and it's, it's just a checklist. <laughs> Often when I'm in spaces with educators um, and even with parents or youth workers, they just wanna know like specifically, what can I do? Obviously, I do think that there's lots of reading and there's lots of self-discovery that has to be done in order for you to be a really strong facilitator of creating spaces that people feel connected to. But this is a really good stuff. Um, this is a really good resource because it talks about stuff like respect the language, like respect the, 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 the language and the fashion that Black youth bring to spaces. Um, mind your tone, you know what I mean? Be hyper aware of the way that you talk to Black youth and family because, it, you know, microaggressions, and um, like per, per, per paternalistic language or tones, like, you know, that make people feel like they're less than, those are red flags. Um, it talks about like just creating a, the vibe of the space and like, how do you um, uh, create community agreements? How do you manage when people disrespect or they say racist stuff in your space? So there's some good stuff um, there. It talks about like, you know, um, how do we create spaces where black students can co-lead um, and, and just kind of making people aware of that. Some of the stuff you might have to Google, but it at least puts it on your radar because it is just a two page um, resource. Go to the next one. And Chelsea, I'll have you break this one down. Okay. Hey everybody, my name is Chelsea. I've been with the TDSB for 13 years now. I don't know where the time went, um, but one of the roles of the student equity program advisors, um, one of the foundational roles is to collect data from marginalized and racialized students about their experiences, positive and negative, with the school system, as well as strategies that they would like to see implemented to change their experience, to have a more positive experience. And we support um, the school board in creating plans and action plans to address those needs, as well as direct advocacy, as Elena kind of talked about. So when that student says, I've had this really horrible experience, and sometimes it's named anti-Black racism, and sometimes it's not, um, but either way, it's an experience of anti-Black racism. And in those instances, um, I would support the student directly and or indirectly, the parents directly and or indirectly, lead the community agency directly and or indirectly in navigating that space and the protocols and what options they have um, for moving their complaints and concerns forward. So one of the things that we thought was really important in terms of thinking through is oftentimes when people think about Black student experience and when they think about, let's talk about the largest issues, a lot of times they go to graduation rates. And when we're talking about graduation rates, we're talking about grade 12 at this point. We're talking about high school. So often that's the snapshot. Right now, people are talking about um, streaming and de-streaming in the TDSB and across Ontario, which for those of you who aren't so familiar, it's about um, Black students being significantly overrepresented in locally developed course or college-bound courses, as opposed to university-bound courses. And again, we're talking about things from a high school level. But when we look at the data, we know that the second a student enters the school system, they are immediately being impact, impacted by implicit bias, um, by conscious and unconscious bias, as soon as they enter the system. When you look at um, suspension rates and expulsion in any school board, there are students, Black students in kindergarten that are getting suspended, in kindergarten. What are you getting suspended for in kindergarten that there couldn't be a more supportive, restorative or, restorative or transformative way to respond to? So this journey map is really acknowledging and identifying that it's a lifelong experience of institutional trauma that individuals are experiencing um, within the community that they are experiencing structural violence from the institutions that they are um, in 
and that uh, we can't just talk about the high school experience. If we really want to talk about fundamentally transforming the experiences of Black students and creating Black affirming spaces, we have to acknowledge that this is a conversation that needs to start the second, if not before, they enter the school system. So this journey map is sort of showing you some of the data that we've collected um, and reports have addressed and identified over the years that say things like the TDSB did a report a few years ago uh, specifying that in primary school students who uh, black students and their white counterpart counterparts who had the same grades so they both could have A's but when you look at the learning skills so the learning skills are things like able to collaborate with others or um, communicates well even though their grades were the same Black students were being marked significantly less, so like needs improvement or satisfactory, while their white counterparts in primary school were being marked as excellent or great. So even in that way, it's showing and it's demonstrating the ways that anti-Black racism plays out in the school board. And these are some examples of those milestones where we see significant data identifying at all points in the educational experience um, how students are being uh, are experiencing anti-Black racism. Chelsea, you know why we call you. Thank you. That was very, that, thank you for that breakdown and, and for supporting us with um, gathering a lot of the, the research that went into that tool. Um, we are going to go on to the anti-Black racism timeline of oppression um, of education in Ontario. I think that should really say anti-Black racism timeline of race, of, Okay, do you see what it says on the actual slide here? Timeline of anti-Black racism in education in Ontario. So sorry, the slide is a little messed up, but the resource actually has the correct um, title on there. And this is one of my favorite resources because I think that a lot of times, just like what Chelsea was saying, we need to look at the full journey. And as we're looking at the full journey, we also need to look at the full history and understand that, you know, it says here 1850, that schools were legally segregated in Ontario. So they had schools for white students and they had schools for black students. And if a black student happened to be in an area where there was only white schools, yes, they might allow the black student to, to go to that school, but they couldn't go there at the same time that the white students were there, or they had to sit in a very, like in a different part of the classroom. And I think that that, under, that, that it's really important that we understand that the education system is, is founded on those pieces. So I think that this, um, beyond it just being a learning piece for folks, because it goes all the way up to 2020, um, beyond, beyond it being a learning piece for us to understand kind of just how historical events have impacted um, Black um, student and family experiences through the education experience, um, through the educational, through their educational journey, I think it's really important to understand um, how we can use this as a resource to teach others that don't know how to do this. So if you're like a educator that has a position of responsibility, um, or you lead, you know, you're part of a team of people that lead professional development or you're a youth worker that works with like provides after school programming. This is something that you can print off and you can put um, up in your classrooms or in your community space and just remind people of, 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 of kind of why things kind of are the way that they are, you know, and that there, there is a long history that we have to face when trying to address some of these issues. So this is also gonna be printed off um, long poster format. Um, and we're gonna be giving everyone that's come to this session, we're gonna be giving you two um, um, Black Youth Resiliency posters and we'll be printing off some of these resources um, and we'll be including that um, in your little um, poster tube thing that we send to you. Um, because we really just wanna get this information out there. This project was funded, so we do have some funds to support that. And we would like to send that out to you. So I'm going to make sure that I put the poster mail out in the, the chat box for folks to fill that in. So fill that in. It just says it's for the posters, but we'll also include some additional resources in there as well. Um, and also after we're going to talk about one more resource, after we do that, we're going to go straight to the Q&A. So if you do have any questions, I know that the chat is disabled and I, I apologize about that. Like... <laughs> I figured I'd be a Zoom pro at this, but clearly I'm not. But it's also maybe just to, to make sure, because um, we did circulate this far and wide and we wanted to have things smooth as possible. The Q&A function is open. So if you'd like to submit any questions, we do have a good 
you know, 10, 15 minutes to go through some questions. I do have, I do see a couple there now. So if folks want to go ahead and put their questions in the Q&A as we go, um, we can um, answer some of the questions and try to make this a little bit more interactive. I'm assuming I'm going, yes? Oh, yes. Sorry, Chelsea. Okay, this yeah, is yeah. another okay. document that Chelsea's been very instrumental in helping us. And I think that that's really important, right? Like, it takes time to really understand the, the intricacies of how the system works. And, you know, I, I've been privileged enough to work within the education system the last three years. I've worked in community spaces for like fifth, the last 15 years. And I'm still learning so much about how things happen. I'm learning so much about how do I navigate power at without it kind of backlashing on me? And how do I navigate relationships so that way I'm actually helping the student that I'm working with, or I'm actually helping the staff member that I'm working with without putting them in further danger? So again, we, we consulted Chelsea a lot to just try to figure out how, what's a simple, straightforward way that we could get this information to people that have no idea how the system is structured or who to go to when they need help. So yeah, Chelsea. Okay, yeah. So um, one of the things that I think is super important in terms of me responding to referrals and requests for support, um, one of the major things is who do I talk to when I'm having a problem? When something is not being handled in the way that I think is appropriate, or I've brought an issue forward and it's being dismissed, or they're saying um, it's unreasonable, or that's not what really happened. Like, what do I do and what are my options? I don't know how many of you have ever like physically gone on to an institution website, like the TDSB, the Peel District School Board, the Durham Region, like saying navigating those um, websites are so challenging. I can know the exact name of the report that I am looking for. I will type the exact name into the TDSB search and I still can't find it. Like they are very not user-friendly. And to be honest, when we think about complaint processes, we know that there's a channel of uh, command and there's a channel of command specifically for accountability. But people don't know if I have an issue with the teacher, who do I bring it to? The principal. Okay, well, if I don't like what the principal said, or if I don't agree with what the principal said, what's my option? You can bring it to a superintendent. Most people don't know that. If you don't like that option, what can you do? You can bring it to an executive superintendent. You can bring it to an associate director. You can bring it to a director. You can bring it to a superintendent of human rights. Every school board has a specific set um, of of who to access as you're going through this process, but it's not very easily accessible to folks. So what we wanted to do was to create a very clear, simple, um, not convoluted structure that says, these are the places that you can go. These are the people that you can talk to if you want to um, share a complaint or have a complaint addressed. Um, so that is what mostly um, that specific complaint process looks like. Um, and again, like it's great for students. It's great for parents. Um, I think one of the things that I always like to say is sometimes complaint processes don't work because people assume that what you are being told by the system is correct. So if they say this is, let's say you have a student, right? And your student wants to go to a university class and they've only taken college classes this far, thus far. And so they say, I'm sorry, that's not an option for you anymore. Even though they're in grade 11, they need to go back to grade nine and take those classes again. There are things called waivers. There are tests that can be done, et cetera. So people assume that the information that they're receiving is the correct information and they stop. So one of the pieces that we, we wanted to make sure was clear, if you think something is unfair or unjust, you keep going you keep going up the chain of command until you feel like you've got an adequate response to your concern um, or your complaint. Lovely. Thank you so much, Chelsea, um, for that and just for the work that you do and for always being accessible when communities need you, especially when I know that that's so difficult and there's so much burnout and you know, um, just kind of having to relive and, and reprocess things. So yeah, I just appreciate to you. Want to big up all the educators that are on the call. I know that there are a few of you here, um, and just um, folks, youth workers. I, um, Louis, you know, um, thank you so much for for bigging up the work and for for your dedication and your support. 
um, and just for your support, even throughout this collaborative process. Um, aside from the four organizations, there were dozens of other organizations that we connected with, that we consulted with um, throughout this process. So just wanna say thank you and, 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 and a special thank, um, thank you to the parents and the caregivers that are also on the call that have to um, navigate this world for their children, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's a very frightening process to have to, to protect your child in this way, especially without having the support and the resources. So we just really want to say thank you to all the families and your self-determination and your efforts and the way that you're supporting other families um, to get through education, which is something that we hope, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Something that, you know, young people can feel truly supported and um, self-determined throughout the way. So I do see that the actual chat does work. So that's wonderful news. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and do the questions. I know um, we're going to have our youth reps come back on and, and facilitate those pieces and I'll also help with some of that. And again, the resources, all the resources that we just went through, they can be downloaded on the website. I put that information in the chat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try to figure out how to get some of these questions. Um, Brittany? Yeah. Um, yeah, so now we're just um, at the portion of today's um, session where we're just going to take some time for attendees to ask any question or any concerns that they have, um, and hopefully we can have the resources to answer them. Okay, we do have a, a question from Estella. You're, you can go ahead and, and unmute your mic if you want to ask your question. And you're also free to put it in the chat if that's easier for you as well. Wondering if we were able to get access to the recording. Yes. This wonderful presentation and how we would be able to get it. It's really great. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for that question. Um, we're going to put it on the website. So it will be available on Stolen From Africa's website. Um, they do have a Black Youth Collaborative Report page that's there. Um, so you'll be able to access it from there. And hopefully, um, yeah, we'll just, yeah, we'll, I'm, I'm assuming that's what it will be. So yeah, it will be on the, the, the website, along with the, the presentation slides, um, and all the resources in the report. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, Brittany, if you guys are able to see the, the Q&A questions. But if not, I can read them for you. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Okay, thank you, Shem, my bad. Okay, so it says, thank you for such an informative session. A huge shout out to all the organizations for the work that is being done for systemic change. What steps should post-secondary institutions take to, re to recruit and support black students? So I'll just put that out there to, to um, Maybe we can ask our youth reps, what are some things that you think that post-secondary institutions, because I know a lot of you, or two of you, Shem and Bertani, you both are um, at York and at Trent University. How did you get there? And what do you think should be done to, to improve those numbers to support black students to go to school? Um, for me personally, it was really my mom, to be honest. She really pushed me to go hard in school. For me, school was never really a big thing in my life for my own personal goals. For me, it was always about money, 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 money. And school wasn't making me any money, but she made me realize that school was the foundation to make money in like, you know, 20, 15, whatever, how many years. And that's what really made me focus on it and try to get ahead. Um, in terms of what high schools can do, I think just in general, like what you guys, this whole presentation where you guys are talking about how, you know, we need to be more inclus inclusive about our histories and and things like that um just to just bring awareness to why black students and black youth feel the way we feel you know and I, once we understand that we can get ahead of it and start to elevate wonderful uh yes. yeah and i agree with what shem says and i think a really good way to make sure that black students are incorporated and you have like a better representation of um, black students and families within post-secondary and within the school system 
them is really having those safe spaces um, where they can express themselves and make sure you have clubs, you know what I mean, and, and stuff where Black students, they can go and meet other Black students and share um, their common experiences. Mm -hmm. A lot of the BSAs, we worked with a couple of BSAs or Black Student Associations at um, York, at U of T, at Ryerson, and they've been really helpful in strengthening some of the community programs and also um, bridging stuff with um, schools, like doing school tours and stuff like that. I know that that's been having the BSA members facilitate tours and stuff. Does anyone else want any, um, have anything to add? Yeah, I, I would love to add to that if possible. Um, <clears throat> So I, I think that the same way that organizations have um, partnerships with school boards or um, you know within schools in their communities, it should be the same with post-secondary institutions. Um, one thing that that we've done at SBL is we recently opened up a youth space within the, the university that's you know right in the heart of our community. Um, and the reason why that is is because we have a lot of young people who are transitioning from our program, going into post-secondary and are still looking for supports, right? Are, are still looking for ways to be connected. Um, so that space has been, has been an opportunity for them to connect with each other, um, connect with, with um, uh, supports, um, supports that, are, that go beyond um, high school because we can't assume that once you finish high school that you're ready to go, everything's great in that university or college or whatever is gonna be a breeze. Um, so I think what, what post-secondary institutions can do um, is to create more partnerships with community, with individuals, um, with, with folks, and, and you know, be able to, to create those spaces um, for advocacy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. If, if I just add as well, um, one of the things that I think you know, matters is representation. So to have um, members of UBSA or the U of T Black Student Association actually physically go into schools where they're trying to outreach to, to students so that they can see the representation in the reflection makes uh, a huge difference. The other thing I just wanna talk about is after they get in. So there's one piece about getting them in and then there's another piece about retention. Mm -hmm. And so I'm an, I'm an instructor of social work at a college and um, I think often when I talk to Black students in my classes, um, a number of them will, some of them will fail in other instructors' classes and then come into my class to repeat the course. And when I ask them what's happening, they say, you know, they get messages from instructors similar to would be happening to them in the um, in the educational system where they're told things like the way that you speak is not professional enough, you're not ready or you need to rethink the way that you uh, dress or position yourself or your mannerisms are, are aggressive or things that we know, we know are microaggressions towards specific communities. And it's great that some of those students specifically will retake the course, but there's others that say, this is clearly not the path for me because of those demeaning messages that they're receiving from instructors. So how do we, how do post-secondary institutions also create a space of caring? And just like we're talking about now, creating affirming and meaningful spaces for Black students within post-secondary institutions and not just the ones that are connected to BSAs, like that student who is the lone student represented in that class or in that program that doesn't feel that sense of connection. How are you building that sense of connection um, so that they don't feel socially isolated and alone, which also um, can contribute to not wanting to continue or complete that program? Sounds like we need to do another checklist, Chelsea. Black Youth Collaborative reps, you guys ready to do another checklist? That's an interesting one. And I think that that's definitely something that we thought about because we initially, when we started you know, doing the research, it was like, do we focus on 12 all the way to like your master's? Like, is that the journey? But we realized it would be a lot. It's, it was such a big thing to tackle. We, we focus on just the, the JK to, to grade 12 experience. But I think that that is, that is some, there, there's some data and some information that we, we really do need in regards to just navigating post-secondary. So thank you all for that piece. Another question that I see here, and I, I see that it is um, five minutes to eight, but we do just have this one last question. Um, the question was just asking young people about what was, what was your experience like throughout this project and, and what was it um, like being at the forefront of, doing some of this work. Have you been in other 
situations where you did similar work? I, I think that that's kind of the question. Like, what is it? What was it like for you to be a part of this process? I'm not sure if Jade or Shem wants to take the lead on that. Yeah, I can go. So uh, this is my first time being a part of a volunteer process. Like I said, I'm usually about the money. So anything I do is I get money. And then, so this is my first time doing that volunteer thing. And what really made me want to do it was- You also got paid, Shem. Okay, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. that's okay. <laughs> Oh, so sorry about that. Um, anyways, what really made me want to do this volunteer thing was I needed to get my volunteer hours for school. And um, yeah, I joined it. So, but what I've learned from this so far is one, the, like Lana was talking about earlier was the intricacies of the system. And it gets, it's pretty in depth. So there's a lot of different, you know, um, we're talking about the chain of command and things that people should know that they don't know. And that was something I found interesting that I, I got to learn through this experience. I also I got to learn um, different, just professional and um, professional and just a, a higher way of thinking where like, you know, we're, I'm getting older and I'm going into the business world. So I want to learn how to do presentations like this, like just, um, sort of the, on Excel, uh, you know what I mean on Excel with um, the spreadsheets, that's what they call this are yes. and things like that. So that's where also where I get my, learning from, from this project. 100. 100. I, I guess just, I really want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is that you, Jada? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I guess I volunteered in the past and like done stuff like this before, but something like different. But I guess what maybe join this project is kind of like, it intrigued me that it's going to be, it was multiple students from around the school board. And I kind of wanted to know everyone's experience. Cause like I'm from Melbourne and I went to Pierce since that's kind of like just one set of experiences but I kind of wanted to know what everyone else was experiencing and then I realized we all were experiencing the same thing and so it's kind of like it was I what I liked about it is that we all could relate and it was all like we had an understanding like we it was like we didn't have to say much we understood each other and then I, I it was able to learn more about like my leadership skills and like learning how to talk to big groups of people like I've never really done something like this before like in a in the, like in this scale so it's kind of nice to do something like this yeah absolutely thank last you last I just want to add I think for me you know being a I have done work in the past you know I've volunteered ever since I've known um with community groups um participated in extracurricular and my school's BSA but I think this project is so unique because, as Jada said, um, it was bringing uh, students from across the different um, school boards uh, or across from like the different um, schools. Um, so it was all all different and unique experiences. And I think for me personally, um, it's just been a really trying road because sitting down and hearing um, other people's experiencing is really hard. Um, you know, them talking about experiencing racism or, you know, a teacher being microaggressive and, you know, you like relating to them and, and feeling that trauma has been so trying. But, you know, I think the work that we've done so far is so amazing. I, I think, you know, we've been able to come together, be vulnerable, um, share experiences experiences and come up with this amazing report and I hope that everybody has a chance to read it and as I said before this is a work that should not be uh, published and put on a shelf or lost online on a web page so come on share the message um, and, and let this be something that transcends um, and is more. Absolutely thank you all for sharing your experiences and I just want to highlight that what I really do appreciate about this project was that it was really well funded and it allowed for us, I know you guys kept saying volunteer, but I just want people to know it was, it's volunteering, like, you know, to be a part of it, but they also were given some honorariums. And I think that it's really important that when we're asking young people, especially marginalized young people, racialized young people to come to the table and to lead work, that they are compensated as best as possible for doing that work because they came after school. Um, and then they, they participated throughout the pandemic online doing this work. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of their personal experiences inform so much of the resources that were created. So we didn't highlight one of the resources, but one of them is a, a, a student's guide to COVID-19 and, and navigating virtual education. 
So in March, when everything was shut down and our programming had to go online, we all got online. We all figured out how to use Zoom. Um, all our youth reps got online and they told us like, um, we can't get access to our teachers. Our teachers are, we're experiencing backlash because our internet doesn't work or because our devices aren't working properly. And we're, we're, we were told that we can't fail, but our teachers are giving us failing marks anyways. So, and you know, there's lots of distressing, there's mental, emotional, there's a lot of, 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 of things going on at that time. And because of their experiences, we were able to create a guide that had like templates of emails that you can send to your teacher or to the principal if you feel like um, you're being treated unfairly. Um, there was, you know, an outline of policies that, you know, you cannot fail. Their teachers cannot fail you. Therefore, if they try to fail you, this is what you can do. Um, the, here are resources to, um, you know, government support for parents that no longer, um, or families that have lost income. So there was, there was just, we, because they were able, because of um, how instrumental and how um, um, ready to lead throughout this process they were, we were able to actually create a lot of things on the fly to support hundreds, th maybe thousands of students across the system during that time. So I just wanna say that, you know, for me in anything that I do as an educator, as a community worker, I always think it's really important to center the communities that we're supporting and I'm just really grateful to you all as uh, Black students, grateful to all the, the organizational reps at the table for taking the time to come together um, and, and, and work towards some of this stuff. So I'll go ahead and leave it there because I do see that it's 801. Um, Brittany, do we have any um, closing remarks? Um, yes, we do, absolutely. Um, so that's it. Um, Thank you for tonight, everyone. So we just wanna do a quick thank you. Um, yes, and I'm sorry, cause I also have this call to action, but this is, this is stuff that's also in the report because we know that even though the project, sorry, Brittany, we know that even though um, the project is over that there are still, um, there's still obviously lots of work. And we, we know that, you know, now that we're not as well resourced as before to do this work and we're, you know, we're also all as educators, as youth workers, um, working within environments that are underfunded to begin with. So it's very hard to continue this work when it isn't well resourced, but we do have um, a call to action and some next steps for um, the government of Ontario to look at, for school boards to look at, for educators to look at, for community organizations to look at. So if you can check that part out in the report, the report is only eight pages um, and there's also a one pager. So please check that stuff out just to see how we as a how we can continue this collaborative effort um, moving forward. All right, so um, I just wanna say thank you to Alana. Thank you to all um, the black organizations that are on this call. Um, because it's, it's been such an amazing process and I'm so happy, we're so happy that we get to be a part of it and get to be at the forefront of everything. Um, and we just wanna give a big thank you to everybody in attendance for taking the time um, out of your summer evening to be here and, and listen to the work that we've come up with, the work that we've created. Um, so we really want um, to stay in touch so we hope that the session was informative and that you leave with more knowledge and tools and resources to create positive affirming spaces for black students and families. We wanna say, we wanna stay in touch. So please uh, um, visit our website and add us to your email so that we can uh, keep you up to date. Again, thank you for joining us today. Um, stay in touch, stay safe um, and stay up. <laughs>